Rickroll can't get enough of royalty and streaming companies, and that's because they're some of the best performing stocks in mining. You need to look at them as de-risked mining investment, but with a dividend. So if you want to learn more, watch this video. Hello and welcome to our viewers on cruxinvestor.com. And for those of you new to Crux Investor, or if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We spoke earlier today to Julian Traeger, he's the CEO of Anglo Pacific Group. They're an LSE royalty and streaming company. Now, Julian talks to us about his company's strategy and growth plans, the structuring of contracts and how they de-risk investment and maximize returns for shareholders, where they sit in the financing mix, their investment focus and shareholder dividends. Plus he explains to us the difference between ETFs, royalties and streaming. If you want to look at any of those topics, look in the description below, click on the relevant timestamp and that will take you to the relevant part of the interview. Plus I need to make an apology for the audio. One of the mics was struggling with a technical issue, so I apologize for that. But let's find out what Julian had to say. We've been quite keen to understand a little bit more. We've spoken to a lot to American companies, mm -hmm. and there's some big companies, billion dollar market caps. You're over here in the UK on AIM. Yeah, or LSE. Uh, we're fully listed, yeah. Fully listed on, on LSE. Market cap circa 350. Yeah, 350, the week. 400, 400 million pounds. And pounds as well, okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the company? Give us a minute summary, and then we'll kind of get into some questions. Well, Anglo Pacific's the only listed royalty company on the stock exchange here, so we're pretty unique uh, in the London market. And um, unlike many of our peers in North America who focus on gold and silver, we focus on other metals. But it's a really interesting business which allows investors to get a de-risked exposure to a risky sector, and that's, I think, its great appeal. Right, okay. Well, let's start with the terminology. Royalty, streaming, what do those things actually mean? Well, there are different ways of financing uh, the mining sector, which is very capital intensive. Mm. A royalty, which is what the majority of our company consists of, but we are getting more and more into streaming. Uh, but a royalty consists of basically giving money to a mine in exchange for a share, normally a percentage mm. of their revenue. So that's a combination of uh, their production and the price that they get for those commodities. A stream is more like a contract around a specific amount of the commodity at a fixed price. Um, so they do have different characteristics, they have different tax effects, um, but generally they are forms of finance for this uh, sector. Right, and, and I think it's, this sector's you know, found it quite hard in the last two, three years. The commodity, commodity price is quite depressed. Um, what type of companies do you best serve? Because if you look at the entire food chain in terms of financing, you can go and issue some shares, mm. get a little bit of money that way, private placements, you've got debt way over here, and you've got a bunch of, sort of structured finance in the middle. So where, where do you position yourselves when you're talking well, to companies? Ultimately, we are interested in helping people who need money. And actually, there are two forms of that. So half of what we do is roughly providing money directly to the miners. Mm. The other half actually is buying second-hand royalty. So sometimes right. we're providing liquidity to people who already have a royalty, but they want to cash out and they don't know how to do so. When, it talk, when we talk about in the miners who we are most uh, useful to, it's generally not the biggest companies because they have lots of um, access to capital and it's not very expensive for them. So it tends to be more sort of mid or smaller companies which need money in order to expand or to mm. get into operation who are our target audience. But these, are, these guys who are in production, they're cash flowing and they're looking for some growth capital, I guess they call it, and you're providing some kind of structure. Every company's going to be different because the needs are different. The yeah, and every different. royalty, every, every stream is unique. Right. Um, I mean, a lot of what we've done historically has been producing, hmm. uh, but obviously producers are less needy of finance than people who want to get into production. And so recently we have broadened our scope to look at earlier stage projects which might need money in order to get into production. And what's happening at the moment in the mining sector, which is very good for us, uh, because we have quite a lot of cash, we don't have any debt, 
uh, and um, therefore we're in a good position, is that there's very little money available to the mining sector. It's really dried up in the past year or two um, because people have been more interested in, I don't know, marijuana stocks or, you know, um, bitcoins, etc. Mm. Um, and so it's a really good backdrop for us to deploy the capital which we have on our balance sheet to use. But you're, you're about risk mitigation in all of this. You've got a structure deal which is going to work for you. It's going to limit your exposure by structuring it, it appropriately. But if you come down to the explorations end of the, 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 the mining market, it's inherently much more risky. Yes. How do you identify risk? What are the things that you think uh, if it needs to have this sort of profile before I'll go well, into exploration or development? That's a good question. I mean, first of all, I think what we see us providing our investors with is a de-risked way of getting exposure to the mining sector. And that really sits at the forefront of everything that we do. When you invest in Anglo-Pacific, which is an investment company, not a mining company, um, you get a exposure to the sector which is really not uh, uh, linked to capex or opex. It's really only in, linked to production. Um, and therefore, a lot of the day-to-day -day problems that bedevil the mining sector, we avoid. Only very extreme events affect us, but day-to-day, -day, you know, higher costs or much higher capex it flows over us. So that is an important distinction because the mining sector is so risky and volatile. And to give people a de-risked way of getting exposure to that is actually very valuable. And in Canada, mm. uh, you know, our peers trade at double to triple what the mining companies do here. Unfortunately, because people don't really understand the virtue of the royalty model, that, that isn't the case. But then when we look mm. at how we um, de-risk uh, the business, um, we only invest in what we believe to be safe jurisdictions. Okay. So we are in, you know, Brazil, we're in um, uh, mainly in Australia, we're in Canada, we're in Spain. Uh, we don't go to places where uh, we think there's going to be issues. Mm -hmm. uh, then we look for like very good operators, very good counterparties, people who are res responsible, who are good in terms of ESG. Um, we look for commodities which we think are going to be more valuable than the market expects. Um, we look for mines which are very long life, which are going to be low cost. So everything we do is constantly de-risking uh, the exposure uh, for the company. And so if we were to do a risky development royalty, which is what you were talking about mm -hmm. initially, mm -hmm. um, we generally would put very small amounts of money to work initially. And then we would commit at our option generally uh, to put more money to work as the project gets de-risked over time. So we, we do look at de-risking everything at the same time you know we are also growing fast and we need to um you know show expansion well, absolutely so it's, it's a lot you just talked about a lot there. so there's some real some real uh, uh you know meaty topics there okay jurisdictional risk i mean canada australia very low risk i put brazil slightly below them and spain yeah. below that well, which year it is yeah. uh, below that so you you know, you need to evaluate jurisdictional risk on its own as an internal subject. With regards to the, the, the company and the stage it's at and its man the management team's ability to deliver, yes. that's an entirely different subject. Have they done it before? Have they done it before in this jurisdiction yes. with this commodity at this stage of development? So, you know, if, if investors are... And of course, there's a whole geological de-risking piece course. that we need to have Absolutely. people looking at so the underlying business. Yeah, mining is mining. And I guess what I'm asking is if people are thinking or considering royalty or streaming or ETFs, they need to have faith in your ability to make those assessments, mm. right? So how do you do that? Do you buy in consultancy when you're doing your diligence? Because I know you don't, you have a, you know, a small portfolio. You, you, I think that's right. Well, we are growing it. We have about 14 Right. major role. But it's, it's not, not a hundred. But it's not, it's not a hundred. It's not an easy uh, And because unlike our peers in Canada who do really only gold and silver, and that's very specialized, we are doing many commodities all over the world. You're quite right. We do tend to outsource uh, a lot of the due diligence to the best and the brightest. And we mm. have a small team here um, that initially processes um, the deal flow. So last year we had 
300 transactions that came through the door and we did two. Um, so most of them get dismissed initially on jurisdictional bases or they're not at the right stage. It's not uh, that complicated, mm. but we do tend to outsource. But ultimately, I think investors are backing you know, the track record of the team. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I joined five, five and a half years ago. In our wow. first year, we had three million pounds of income. This year, we should have, you know, 60 to 70 million pounds of income. So, so we have had a period when, during which, as you say, the sector for mining has been quite challenged, where we have made um, decisions and investments which have borne fruit. And we haven't Fortunately, Absolutely. stumble. Absolutely. And, and I think ultimately that's what investors need to, you know, believe in. I think. Well, and we'll come on to it because I think if they look, uh, because your uh, recent recent PowerPoint, I think it's the one you did for the AGM. Mm. Very good numbers, sets of numbers in there, and we'll talk about those. But you talked about the word, you said the word growth there. I mean, you've got to continue that trajectory. That's mm. the, the the beast you got to feed, as mm. it were. Well, that's yeah. not. I mean, it is difficult to find royalties which tick all our criteria. On right. the other hand, um, you know, the gold and silver space is about 15% of the mining sector by value. Mm -hmm. And there are approximately $35 billion of listed royalty companies which focus on that. Mm -hmm. The other 85%, which consists of, um, you know, steel and iron mm -hmm. ore and coal and copper, etc., isn't really serviced in terms of royalty. So there's right. an enormous universe for us, we don't see very much competition. But, uh, but likewise, that the size that, that entire universe is not necessarily investable if you uh, apply your investment criteria to it. It might come down to 20% of that, yeah. potentially. Or yes, less. but that's still, still a, a big, big number. number yeah. right. Okay, we're in violent agreement yeah. about that one. But, we, but what you now need to be able to do is work out how to find, you need to find, you need to find them. Need to yes. go to those are the ones we do. There's a bit of competition out there. Probably. Not much, though. Not much over here. Do you say internationally you don't really tend to come up against other royalty providers or finance providers? Because it's not just about royalties, is it? There's lots of structured finance out there. Well, we are finding um, very little competition globally from non precious royalty companies. Okay. And the precious ones can't really get into non precious because it dilutes their golden sheen. Um, and there are obviously people who are uh, providing debt finance, uh, not so much from the banks, but alternative debt finance yeah. vehicles. But ultimately, um, they're not that large and the royalty is more equity-like than debt-like. Our royalties don't have to be repaid. Um, so I think we fit more into the sort of um, preferred equity type mezzanine bucket, right. um, where actually <laughs> there's a lot of demand at the moment. There is a lot of demand, but I think there are quite a few companies out there that would purport to offer structure finance solutions to companies. Because I, I remember my, my days in banking, hmm. CEO comes along, I need some money. And they're in a, not necessarily a perilous state, but they're in a state where perhaps the big banks don't want to provide pure debt because the moving parts aren't quite aligned and they don't want to dilate, obviously. And they will look at money is money. Hmm. Okay, What you call it, how you structure it and what it, ultimately what it costs you, you know, that, that's, that's where they're going to focus. That's what they're going to focus on. So you're saying that I, obviously you're a big company here in, in the UK. Well, and we're and not the international company. Yes. Okay. I think people yes. are very happy yes. <laughs> if they had what you had. Um, you, you were saying that you're not seeing that level of competition. When, you know, when no, CEOs I think, come to you, they, they I know think what they want. Relatively. Um, the amount of capital available to the mining sector has reduced over the past couple of years. It has. Um, whereas yeah. um, there hasn't, there, there's a built up demand for new mines to come on board because unless we invest in new mines all the time, the existing mines deplete. Sure. So I think there is um, at the moment a, um, an excess of, of demand for funding of the supply, which is why um, we are tilting our business towards growth at this stage because we think right. there's this window of opportunity, you know, we should have, if we don't deploy any capital, 50 million pounds roughly on our balance sheet towards the end of this year, early next year. Yeah. And we've got about $100 million of unused borrowing lines. And so we think the moment is ripe for us to 
um, you know, make hay while the sun isn't shining um, for, uh, for, uh, for the sector. And do you think, because there, there there's, there's a few kind of chinks in various commodities. You know, I think battery metals has risen and slightly fallen with, you know, things like cobalt and lithium. Yes. away. You have to have a much longer term outlook. Your contracts are much longer term. So yes. you can't have a short term outlook. That no. and, and if you know, I think of Cobalt 27 and their, their bet on Cobalt yes. didn't quite work, work out. out and the Nickel 28 and hopefully that will work out. But again, you know, people would bet against that. There, you, how do you identify the commodities or do you identify the commodity thesis and say, right, that, that I believe this is going to work? Or are you saying, actually, the fundamentals of this company, because it's lowest quartile uh, in terms of its ASIC or whatever criteria you allocate, I, that's good enough for me. I don't need to worry about what the outlook is as long as I get the best companies in class. No, I don't think that's true. I think we have to do both. Okay. Uh, but because of the power of commodity pricing cycle. Mm. Uh, even if you choose the best company and you've chosen the bad commodity, mm. and that commodity holds in value, you're still going to be um, harmed by it. So mm. we um, start, I mean, obviously, we get a lot of deal flow coming through the door. So we just look at it. And mm. uh, we, there is an opportunistic element to it. But yeah. ultimately, you know, we are trying to make bets on commodities, where we think that the market is underpricing the opportunity set. So when there was this um, bubble for lithium and cobalt, um, you know, our view was that there's a lot of that material in the world. You know, there's so much noise in the sector, which is driven by short term trading, we've got mm. to sift through that and look, as you say, correctly, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, what are the prospects for those commodities? And mm. I think you'll see with both cobalt and lithium, you know, there's much more supply than people expected and the fundamental pricing is you're going to be much more normal mm. uh, but there are other commodities particularly commodities that are out of favor well, which talk to us about that. You know, i've looked at your, your portfolio some of, the, some of the larger ones i mean you do seem to have picked things that perhaps people have shied away from yes well i think that that does happen in the sector mm -hmm. i think you know when people shy away from them and the art looks very poor then there's no new minds that come on and then ultimately um, you know, the supply um, X is, is much lower than the demand and the price recovers and then people start to get money and build mines and so on. Yeah. So I think we need to, you know, t I think you make money in the mining sector by being a contrarian, not a trend follower. Mm -hmm. Because if you follow the trends, you're going to get, um, you know, investing at the top the and, and sell at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so you've got yeah. to, you know, keep thinking. and. Um, so the areas I think we need more exposure to now are the base metals, are the um, some of the battery materials which you know we are keen on, like for instance vanadium, we've already got exposure to. Yeah. Um, so we are taking you know trying to be thoughtful because ultimately also we're investing a lot of our own money. You know, myself and the current board and the previous board have eight to nine percent of the business. Mm -hmm. So every time we invest a pound. We're investing eight or nine p of our money, uh, and so we, you know, we think of it in that way, and we're very careful and prudent. So, but I look at some of the things that you, you've got coal in there, mm. coke and coal, mm. right? So most people look at that and go, well, that's dirty, dirty energy or whatever it's being used to apply for. In your in your case, are you under any pressure from your shareholders to shy away from from some of those things? I, I, I appreciate trends is one thing, but this kind of green economy is another. Well, I, I would argue actually that the coal that we own is greener coal to the extent that that's right. possible. It's higher quality coal, right. it's less polluting, and the coal that we own in general is used to make steel. Uh, and right. there is no replacement for that coal. So if right. you want to have a world which doesn't have steel, mm. and then we're all going to be, I don't know, on gravel roads with donkeys, then, then that's fine. But um, Ultimately, um, particularly not only with the coal, but the other commodities we've invested in, one of our areas of emphasis has been on purer, cleaner, less polluting commodities. So mm -hmm. uh, we're positioning Anglo Pacific as a finance vehicle which finances a cleaner world. Now, it may not be a clean world, but it's a cleaner world. Uh, and I think that that's an important distinction. Um, and so when we look at new opportunities, one of the criteria we look at as well is, you know, how pure 
um, is this commodity? How uh, free of contaminants is it? Uh, because our thesis overall is that we're in this long-term cycle when um, uh, you're going to get higher and higher premia for cleaner and purer products. And if you have dirty, rubbish products, mm. they're going to be increasingly discounted and difficult to sell. Okay. So you're, you're pushing that agenda. You're under no pressure from shareholders or any, anywhere else, whether they be. I mean, how, in terms of how does the shareholding break down, actually, in terms of institutional versus retail? In which parts of the world does it come from? Does it get well, a sense of I, that? I think, um, although we do have a listing in Canada, right. a large proportion of our shareholders are based in the UK. And we've right. got, um, you know, three or four or five institutional shareholders who are, you know, between eight and 10% roughly. Right. Um, and then there's a long tail of retail shareholders who are attracted by the de-risk way of getting exposure to the mining sector, mm. but also by the very high and consistently increasing dividend that we pay. Um, and for them, you know, it's a, 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 not something to worry about and it allows them to get reasonably dependable income yeah. in an environment where you know bonds are yielding nothing and interest rates are in another cycle of decline. Yeah, we, I'm glad you brought that up. You, you are dividend paying and you have been for some time. You've, you've yeah. given a lot back to the shareholders because you have, you have de-risked or removed the need to think too long and hard about uh, mining and the constituent parts, moving parts of mining investment. You're doing that for people because mm. you've got the team here to do that. You, along with ETFs, you put yourself in, in a very different area from conventional, you know, equities investing. Yeah. And that's working for you. It's working for in the equities and uh, so, so for the royalty and streaming section, sector for sure. Mm. Um, ETF versus royalty, who's, who's better? Well, I don't know much about the ETF uh, market. You know. Uh, I put my money in uh, the business that I know. I, I don't know if the ETFs provide the income, but right. um, the ETFs generally just provide commodity exposure, um, which is different to what we're providing. Because in our instance, you get growth in production mm. as well as exposure to the price. Mm. And then you also get um, a significant um, stream of income that's paid out as well and our dividends are generally two to three times covered so it's yeah. not something you need to particularly worry so about. Let's talk about that de-risk component so especially with the producing companies when you're putting a, a, a 10-year comp well you wouldn't go as long as 10 year maybe. No no we want more. You want In more? fact okay. one of the things that we try and do ideally we, we look to find a mine which has a 10, 15, 20 year life right? and we pay when we buy it for their um, reserves yeah. But generally, they have much larger areas and much more resources. Yeah. And we try and get those for free. So we don't pay for them. Right. Um, so there's, there's optionality as well built into our portfolio, which you wouldn't find in an ETF. But there's a lot more bells and whistles, too. And if I, I'm just looking at one which can, I won't name the name of the, of the company, but if I look at sure. some of the moving parts, and I think this, it's important for people to understand the options or the tools available to you, mm. which de-risk it, you know, in the case of this company has borrowed money over a seven year period, it's a significant amount, 60 to 70 million we'll call it, um, and they can draw that down in tranches. They can choose to, choose to uh, draw it down uh, day one or not yeah. so at, at their option, but it's at LIBOR plus 5.5 to 6.7%, so mm. you know, there's a there's an uplift there. Um, you've got 100% interest on the capitalized cost going through to March 21, 2021. Mm. You know, so they, they can they can basically do it as an interest-free holiday, as it were, in, mm. in there. Um, the company can pay back at 65% before the, the date of maturity of, mm. of, of the paper. It's 2% fee mm. payable. Mm. on each tranche that's drawn down. They've got fixed $10 per ounce production link payment for the first five hundred ounce. And the list goes on. Yeah, no, There's no, like, it's no, true. It goes on and on. So, that, so, so you guys can structure this in a way which suits the company, obviously, or else they won't sign. Mm. 
but it means that the risk exposure to heat guns is hugely limited at each stage. Not, it's not just a one number, day one, and that's what it's going to be. This changes over the term of the contract. Hmm. Is that no, part I of think the that that's source? correct. Well, I think there are many, listen, each royalty is a, is a bespoke contract. Absolutely. Uh, and there are many, many aspects and terms to it, and there's legal terms as well as financial terms, yeah. and change of control, and options, and yeah. you know, truncating. And, the list and, so, yeah. and so I think um, we can work very hard to make sure that it's the right deal for us, but it also has to be the right deal for the counterparty. Sure. Um, and, um, but, it, but it needs to be the right deal for them just. Yes, well... Enough to get them to sign. They need to sign, but it needs to be clearly better than alternatives. Sure, or they don't sign. Yeah. But, you know, some, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to get at, you know, in terms of identifying them and how much competition there is. And I come from the world of you know, doing uh, convertible bonds. Mm. And when we structured those things, the documents were yay thick. And, mm. um, you know, you had to beat the competition, but you didn't have to beat them by too much. And we mm. that's... No, no that's, obviously, game, right? that's obviously correct. And one of the things that we try and do, um, as I mentioned, is to get, you know, 8 to 12 percent returns for producing and low risk yeah. uh, products, um, but 15 to 25 percent for um, more risky longer term products. Absolutely. So and we try and price things accordingly. And obviously, recently, what's really interesting is that the cost of capital has gone up for yeah. uh, the sector. And so we can get one or two hundred more basis points. Right. So All good for your shareholders. Yes. That, that's the point mm. I'm trying to make here. So for the company, you make it good enough, some of the conditions can fall away during, as, during the term of the contract as, as you've got more and more of your capital back and you're heading towards a number which you're comfortable with. But for your shareholders, you're looking after their interests because that, that's your number one focus. Of course, of course. Right. So the question then is, this is structured finance in, in all that name, for, for us, yeah. as I would call it, right? Um, have you looked at other sectors? Is, you're in mining right now because you know mining, but mm. given money is money, and people, companies want money, from different sectors want money, have you ever considered, in terms of this growth story of yours, have you considered other sectors? Well, we have um, in the past looked at um, oil and gas, and we had had and sponsored a um, royalty company which turned out to be quite a good investment, but it didn't grow in the right. way that we expected. And we are looking now at um, green energy um, royalties. But I think right. we do want to stick, stick to, to, I mean, I don't think we're going to go into, um, go into the recording sector and right. doing royalties there or okay. pharmaceutical drugs. Those are all uh, big things, but you do have to know, you know what you're doing. And I think we have developed here quite a lot of domain expertise, mm -hmm. uh, which we can build on. Okay, okay. Um, so your growth is going to be focused on natural resources, stick to the knitting, do, yeah. do what you know. Because it's a big sector and there's a lot to it's, do. It's huge. So you've got a lot of cash, spare cash at the moment. Do you think you're going to be able to deploy that in the next 12 months? Yes. Okay. And if you are, are you going to go out and get some more? Well, it depends how quickly we deploy it relative to how much we are generating. Yeah. Uh, because we are retaining, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 million dollars a quarter now, yeah. even after we pay out this very well yeah. covered dividend. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so, you know, it, it's a matter of how quickly we spend versus how quickly it comes in. Right. Um, and we have also, as we get a bigger and bigger portfolio, our borrowing lines will grow from around $100 million now, they could get larger. So yeah. we'll have to take it. Um, so you your know, borrowing, borrowing will get cheaper? Because well, borrowing's quite, I mean, not, it's reasonable. It's re <laughs> at the moment. Don't, but it's don't nothing. admit it on camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not a very high rate because right. the banks actually, more than the market, uh, the stock market recognize how de-risked our portfolio is yeah. and the risk that they are not taking. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, given our, significant equity value mm. and there is no debt at the moment and your track record and our track record yeah. they, they, they're quite um, comfortable with um, uh, relatively low rates compared to LIBOR but you your shareholder and your shareholders want the money deployed it's making money out there sitting in the bank not as much yes right no that's true and so we do expect I mean we have in, been investing in increasing our team mm -hmm. um, 
Last year we did two transactions. You know, we haven't done one so far this year, but I'm confident we should do two, three, four uh, in the second half of the year. You've got and, and what commodities are you looking at, given that part of your thesis is looking at the long-term focus? For well, as I said, I think we'd, we'd like to get more exposure to base commodities, right. you know, copper, nickel, right. zinc. Um, we're looking at, you know, some of the fertilizers which are out of favor, mm -hmm. like a potash or a phosphate. Uh, and then we are looking at some of the um, more reasonably priced battery materials because we think um, there's room for more of that within our portfolio. So what about some of the things which, I mean, I know you've got signed contracts or you've got long-term contracts, but can you get out of those? Can you sell those on in a secondary market to someone else if you wanted to? I'm just well, thinking, I'm thinking of things like uranium and vanadium. Vanadium's had a bit of a spiky, rocky well, it's, ride. It's, it's come up and down, but, but our vanadium royalties actually got enormous uh, potential in terms of increasing right. its production. For us, it's not just price. We're not, okay. we're not the trader. So our vanadium um, uh, royalty should have 25 to 30% volume growth this year. Right. But then it could expand very significantly. So do, do you, why, and how does it do that? And how do you, how do you ensure that you're first in the, in the queue? Well, we have the, the royalty over the whole, the whole this, thing, the, all this land. Right. Um, I mean, there are some trickier situations where they expand outside the royalty area, but um, I think in the vanadium case, we're confident that they will expand in the area that we have the royalty over. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, the flip side of the fact that there's no competition yeah. means there isn't a secondary market. Right. Uh, so, so that does mean that when we make the investment, you know, you can check in, but you can't check out. Um, and so you better get it right. So we, so we work very hard to make sure that it, it, it's correct. Um, and uh, our, our working assumption is that we own these royalties or the streams for the life of the mine. Um, but, you know, so, so the entry point is very important and the conviction that we have that the commodity outlook is better than the market expects. Okay, so let's talk about some of the numbers. You, you could, let's say, so we'll, we'll flash up the link to the PowerPoint uh, in the video for people to go to and in the description below, um, below the video. Um, let's talk about some of the numbers. You came in, you said five and a half years ago with yes. a thought in mind, which was? Well, to grow the business, you know, substantially over the and you've, subsequent you've time. Well, we've done some of it, but there's right. still more to, well, that's more to do. So tell us, what, tell us what you walked into, what you did. And well, I think what, we, what I walked into was a situation where, um, you know, the uh, royalty income was falling off a cliff. Mm. The company uh, was running out of cash um, and um, the dividend was unsustainably high. Right. Um, and we had a portfolio of non-core equity holdings, which hadn't really worked out and which mm. were showing significant losses. Mm. And so, you know, we had to jettison the equity portfolio in large part to continue to pay the dividend, but then cut the dividend mm. uh, and then gradually, you know, recover uh, by reinvesting capital uh, and raising a bit of money. So when I joined the company, we had 100 million shares. Today we have 180 million shares in issue. Mm. So over those that period, we've issued 80 percent uh, more equity, mm -hmm. but it was a combination of those things plus making new investments so that by, um, you know, we, we, the company is built upon this historically very valuable royalty in the coking coal space. Um, uh, and one of the things we're doing is trying to diversify the portfolio from that. So when I joined the company as well, we were almost a single asset business. Mm. Um, and, you know, by say 2016, uh, or by uh, we, the Kestrel royalty had grown a lot. By 2018, we had already bought other assets which were of the same size as Kestrel mm -hmm. in 2016. So we are, um, you know, achieving that diversification as well as growth. Right. Okay. But, and, and, and what's that looking? What are the numbers looking like there? Because again, some of the charts look, you know, it's heading the right way. Well, it is Where's it right going way? though? Well, I mean, I, I think our aim would be um, to try and get to a $100 million 
run rate for our royalties, hopefully, yeah. you know, next year or the year and after. Where, you at, where are you? Well, sterling? we're probably around, what well, with the sterling, where it is, at around sort of, you know, Close. 75, yeah. 80 million yeah. okay. uh, dollars. So I think we could still grow another third. Um, and then, you know, to internationalize our register, because I think the more people mm. who are owners of royalties at much higher valuations in Canada are aware of Anglo-Pacific and can switch to Anglo-Pacific, the higher our rating will be. And as our stock um, gets larger, as our earnings get larger, I think we'll be in a situation of a virtuous cycle. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've, I mean if I look back over the, the, the time that it's, uh, it's existed, you know, there was highs of 350 way back in the day. Yes. But since you've come in, since you changed the structure, you've seen a real movement in the share price, positive movement in the share price. You've got to be pleased with that, but you have I'm been pleased with, with it, but our rating is still derisory. Well, that's I mean, you question. know, we're, we're, we're trading uh, something like at an eight times PE ratio to six times cash flow right. multiple, you know, uh, at a 5% Absolutely. dividend yield. I mean, all those things, I think in Canada, Yep. Um, our peers trade at two to three times that. So although we have had some progress, yep. um, and yep. obviously those numbers depend in part upon what the commodity prices do for the rest of the year, they're, they're certainly not in any way or form any profit forecast implied in that. Right. Um, but um, I think that uh, there's tremendous scope uh, for the price to be at a different level um, as the market becomes more educated about the virtues of the royalty model, which hopefully you are part of part that of exercise. Part of the solution, for yes. sure, for sure. Well, we're delighted to learn today yes. about it. I say we haven't, you're the first company we've recorded on the subject with previous life been exposed to it. Um, so that, but again, just to help people understand that bit. So two, three times what, you, so the, the, the Canadian, North Americans are two, three times what you are. What's that down to? Are they better at promoting? Or are they better at, because the markets are more educated? I mean, what, what, what do you think it actually So I think it's to? a combination of factors. I mean, most of those players are focused on gold and silver. Sure. Uh, and gold bugs may be prepared to pay, um, you know, for them because they get a de-risk exposure to a de-risk sector. Mm. And so that's worth a premium. Mm. Most of the, and almost all the Canadian companies are valued off a 5% discount rate. Uh, whereas in London, because we're unique, um, the brokers tend to value us off an 8% discount rate. And one of the things I'm trying to work on is how we can get our discount rate down, particularly given the fact that ultimately a lot of the North American royalty companies have royalties in much more risky places mm. than we do. Okay. Uh, and we would think that being in safe jurisdictions, because a lot yeah. of the discount rates should be driven sure. by the um, sovereign ratings in those markets. Right. And so that's, that's um, a, a, another difference. And then there is in um, Canada and in North America a much more dedicated investor base for royalties. Whereas I think in the UK, uh, what we find is people saying, well, we don't want to invest in mining but we'll have an exposure to Anglo-Pacific because it's a yeah. de-risk way of getting exposure to mining. Right. But they're ultimately coming from a mining um, background or you know, thinking of us in the mining respect rather than thinking of us as a finance business. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. There seems to be a lot of moving parts there which you need to adjust or turn, turn the volume up or down on. Um, plus, it's a very small pool here in mm. you know, the UK. Mm. So which commodities you go after moving forward important. You must know, well, you're covered by uh, how many brokers here? Um, four or five. Right, so you know who the brokers are and you know who's not covering. That's an education process. The market as a whole, it's smaller, it's less knowledgeable, but you're, you're starting a process to help ed educate Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And we're going to be spending much more time in North America I, I think over the next um, 12 months. Um, you know, we have been yep. and we have had some traction. People can see the obvious appeal and the discount yeah uh, so and the differentiators that you have yeah compared to other royalty companies over that yeah because a lot of the royalty companies there as well will do deals at three four five percent which we wouldn't do and i think that fundamentally misprices the risk mm. of the mining sector where things go wrong all the time so we think that you know our base 
return should be closer to 10% because we think that's more appropriate. Okay. Um, and hopefully investors will recognise the virtue of that. We shall see. We shall see. Gillian, thank you very much for your time today. I've really enjoyed that, learning about your company. I'll shake your hand. Very and, good. Uh, thank you for the time and attention. Appreciate it. I'd like to stay in touch with you um, and sort of see, th see how things develop over the next six months and into next year. I know our uh, viewers and subscribers will um, have questions and maybe we'll come back to you with those. Excellent. Look forward to that. Thank Brilliant. you for your time. Thanks very much for watching. We hope you enjoyed that. And, and if you did, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also catch us on our website, cruxinvestor.com and Cruxcast, our podcast series. Plus most days you can catch us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We'd love getting your feedback, so please keep that coming and we'll speak to you again soon.